you and I have the power to change the world, one encounter at a time. Think about that. Change the world? Oh, way too big for me. But I'm here to share with you how we can change the world one encounter at a time. It's all it takes, just one at a time. And our world is in desperate need of change, of help. We are living in times that are so divisive, challenging. We are speaking past each other, not hearing each other. More and more isolated and alone. Politics, religion, and growing economic inequality is causing massive barriers between us. And yet, we can decide to change the world one encounter at a time. So if we see a person who doesn't believe as we do, or we see a person who doesn't vote as we voted, if we see a person who doesn't live as we live, we can still connect with them instead of making them the other. And we do that sometimes, don't we? I do that. <gasps> doesn't think like me, didn't vote like me, doesn't believe like me, <gasps> the other. Don't we do that? You know, I see some heads nodding here. <laughs> But something really sad happens when we see the other in that way. Fear and suspicion reign. Communication becomes strained. How do I talk to these people? And most of all, There's a tendency sometimes to dehumanize them, even demonize them. And the tragic consequence of that is that we no longer see our common humanity. We no longer see what's the same in all of us. It's blocked out. It's lost. Can't find it. Don't see it. Don't hear it, because that person is the other. History has really shown us that it is not good to travel down this trajectory. Think about it. The Trail of Tears, slavery of Africans, the Holocaust, when we stopped being able to see, there's my brother, there's my sister, there's a human being, a child of God. I don't see that anymore. So today I'm here to share with you three instances that have shown me, me as the student of these instances, that it is possible to begin to change the world one encounter at a time. So the first one happened right after the election of Donald Trump. And my husband and I are in a car, and we're driving through New York City. And we're listening 
to talk radio and people are calling in and they're expressing their feelings about the election. And there was so much anger on both sides. This one particular woman called and she was so angry. She was so angry at all of those that were protesting his election. So I'm listening to this woman, and I am getting angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier. I'm right in there with her. I'm her other. She's my other. There we were. Hey, we all have our others, don't we? So I'm listening along, getting more and more angry, more and more angry, more and more angry. And then she said three words. My daughter died. And a little bit later, we're from a drug overdose. And I can remember sitting in the car, and my heart stopped. Oh, God. All of a sudden, in like half a second, I could see everything through her eyes. I could see all of her concerns about border control, illegal immigration, health care costs, financial strain. I could see it all through her eyes. It stopped me cold. And I have to tell you, if I could find this woman, I don't know her name, I don't know where she lives, maybe she'll see this talk, you know. If I could find her, I would invite her to my home, I'd make her a cup of tea, I'd say, share with me your story. And I notice in this place, it's no longer so important for whom she voted. Nor is it important that we might part on the same political page. That's not likely to happen. But it doesn't matter. Because now we're connected by something beyond belief. We all have beliefs. We all need beliefs. And thank God they're different. How do we learn from one another? We're not all going to believe the same thing. How boring would that be? Now we're connected by that common humanity. I don't even know where she is. But she's my sister. I stand with her. I would stand up for her because I'm a mother and I have daughters and I can feel what it would be like to lose a child. I know her. She's not an other to me anymore. She's in here. And the second time, I'm in my hammock. It's a sunny day, having a great time. Just feels really nice, got my headphones on, listening to music. And I think I hear voices. And then I feel a little tap on my shoulder. Uh, Excuse me, ma'am. And I look up, and there are the Mormon missionaries on my patio. Now, I don't know about you, but it wouldn't matter to me what denomination or religion people are. If they're coming onto my patio to have a conversation with me about believing the way they believe, I don't know, in the house, close the door. <laughs> right? Like, whoa. Avoid, avoid. Lock the door, pretend we're not home. <laughs> right. Right. But on this day, 
on this day, I was happy and spacious and open and, hey, sit down on my patio table. No, I did. They probably weren't used to getting a lot of welcomes like that. And they said, well, you know, what do you do? You retired? And I said, no, I'm an interfaith minister. And I'm pleased to serve the Tree of Life Interfaith Temple. <laughs> I kind of got this wasn't a scenario they were trained in. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not sure what that is. Are you Christian? <laughs> and I said, I love Jesus. I love the Bible. But I believe that God has expressed through all faith traditions. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> and then, uh, well, well, you say you believe in the Bible and you believe in Jesus. Have you been saved? Oh, my God, <laughs> a million times every day. <laughs> you don't want to even know how many times I'm saved. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, um, and then the really exciting part happened because I used this lull to ask them something I'd always wanted to know. I said, you know, it must take an incredible amount of courage to go door to door with your faith. I'm not sure I could do that. Knocking on doors, you don't know who's going to answer, what mood they're going to be in, throw tomatoes at you, welcome you in. You don't know. Talk to me about that. Tell me about that. Tell me about that. How did you come to God? And what has brought you to my patio today? Tell me about that. Oh. <laughs> they started sharing their stories. And I, th I think we sat there two, three hours. They shared their stories. I shared more of my story. And along the way, we figured out that we had both made quilts for foster care children, our faith communities. And by the time they left, important, I was no closer to becoming a Mormon. They certainly were no closer to becoming interfaith. But just like with the caller, we were now connected by something much larger than our beliefs for me. I can't speak for them, but for me. So when they walked back down my driveway, I thought, my friends, they're my friends. I hope we run into each other in the grocery store <laughs> or something. I'd love to see you again. And not the other to me anymore. They're in here. I stand with them. And the last example, this was about 10 years ago. I was driving in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Another beautiful day. I got the windows down, the music's up. I'm singing. I'm having a great time. And I come to a stoplight. There I'm at the stoplight. And then I notice one of those homeless men coming, the ones with the sign. And I'm thinking, oh, quick, light change. Quick, change now, quick. He's getting closer. <laughs> What's wrong with the light? Why won't it change? Don't we do that? <laughs> Don't we do that? Oh. But graciously, the light didn't change. So he comes up to my door, and I look up and I make eye contact with him. And it was only half a second, half a second. But I understood what Mother 
Teresa said when she said, we look, but we don't see. We look, but we don't see. Because in that moment, I saw him. (laughs) I saw him. I reached down and I picked up my wallet, took out the first bill I saw, handed it to him. He thanked me kindly. And the light changed. (laughs) And away I went. Whew. Have a second. I have never looked at a homeless person the same way since. Or anyone that lives in stark poverty. I think about him sometimes. I'll think, wow, what was his first day of school like? Did he take the school bus? Someone drop him off? Did he learn to ride a bike? first crush? What were his dreams? (laughs) What were his hopes for his life? And what happened? I don't know where he is, but he's not another to me. He's in here. So, yes, indeed, not only can we change the world one encounter at a time, more importantly, the world can change us one encounter at a time. One encounter at a time. May each of us begin to hear those encounters, see those opportunities, notice what is right before our eyes, so we too can create a different world, future, where everyone matters. And graciously, there are no others. Thank you.